Hello, welcome to my podcast and my YouTube channel. Today I have with me Kevin Briggs. He's one of those American heroes who have a life of service. He was in the army. He was a correctional officer. And then for many, many years, he served as a highway patrol in California. And this is what we're going to talk about today. That's the experience that I want to focus on. Because during those years, he's going to give us a lot of details of what happened, but he, the work that he did back then included patrolling the Golden Gate Bridge. And as you all know, and unfortunately, we know that the Golden Gate Bridge is one of those favorite places for suicide. And this is what he did. He patrolled it. And for many, many years, he received and answered calls for suicide and mental health crisis. And he was the guy who went there and talked to them. So he has a lot of stories to tell. I saw him actually on his TED Talk, which is like a world hit. It's called The Bridge Between Suicide and Life. Uh, last time I checked, Kevin, it had more than 3.5 million views. So that's quite impressive. And today what he does is he's, he's a mental health and a suicide prevention speaker and trainer. Now, like most of us, he's home. He's staying home because he can't do any of those trainings anymore. But thank you so much, Kevin, for saying yes and for being here and for talking to my audience. Welcome to the podcast and to the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me. And also one thing that I didn't mention, but I want you to maybe we can start with that. You also have a personal history with suicide, right? Your right. grandfather? Correct. I lost my grandfather to suicide before um, before I was born. Wow. So people say, well, I don't know if that can affect you. Well, I'm going to tell you, I never got to meet him. So yeah. were we, you know, could we have been best friends and hung out all the time? Mm -hmm. My grandfather on my father's side. So mm -hmm. of course, I, I knew uh, my grandfather on my mom's side. And he was a, a, a man who went through his own sufferings a lot. Uh, an electrician who got burned on a live wire on a large pole and lost his arms, but actually wow. came back, studied hard and became a judge. So, hmm. yes. Yeah, when I read about it, you're saying, you know, people say, well, that may not have affected you. But I, I did wonder, say, I wonder if that had any impact on his life, because I mean, look at what he did in the future, right? He was there trying to convince people not to jump of the Golden Gate Bridge. So that's my first question to you. Do you think it had any influence on that? You know, I think it may have. I, I can't really tell you because a lot of times it's hard for us to tell what is going on with us. People around us can see it's like we give advice and we say, oh, that girl's great for you or she's really, she's hitting on you, but they don't see it, but we see it for yeah. other people. So yeah. I'm not sure, but I can tell you by looking looking at people's eyes that were over the rail, looking right into their eyes and seeing that they want to live, they just can't figure out how, or they're in such pain that they just want that pain to end. That was a big driving factor for me to get better at this craft of negotiations and communicating with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I still want to stay a little bit on your grandfather and I was just wondering can you tell us a little bit of what happened and also maybe even most importantly how it affected your family was it for example a big secret that nobody talked about or was it okay to talk about his suicide did you hear about it when you were a kid so tell us a little bit about your background my father never discussed his father, the individual who suicided with us. So I didn't find this out till I was in my 40s, I think. Wow, was, in your 40s? He never, it was never brought up. So he didn't, he didn't ask, you know, he didn't say anything about it. And the only reason I found it is because I have a half sister who's older and she brought it up. So my father still has not talked about this. And I'm not going to bring it up with him if it's a very sore subject. I know my father was very, very young, maybe three or so, when his father lost his life to suicide. So I think it's something back then that, that folks didn't talk about. 
you know we're just yeah, now yeah talking that about makes sense these things. yeah you know, well, it's amazing things. that even even after you did what you did the career that you had and uh, i'm sure you mentioned to him a few times and even then it wasn't brought up no it wasn't wow. yes i think there's there's probably a lot of pain involved in that mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe for him as well right maybe nobody yeah. talked to him about it either so he really didn't have a father growing up and i'm sure there's resentment and pain involved in that something that he's had to deal with and he just turned 88 uh last week so you know that's gonna go with him to the grave unless mm -hmm. he wants to talk about it with me mm -hmm. which which i doubt to be honest with you yeah oh yeah by now well you never know right sometimes right. when you're right. when you're getting older you say you know maybe some things we we do go back in time and say maybe maybe i should tackle this right things change with time right yeah so Kevin, tell me first, I mean, how does that happen? Did you choose to be in patrol in the Golden Gate or were you assigned to do it? I was, a, when I started with the Marin area for the California Highway Patrol, which handles the Golden Gate Bridge, um, people didn't want to work down there so much. And I didn't know why until I started working down there. I thought it was great. I was by the city. I'm on a motorcycle. I could go down into San Francisco and it's easy to park then on a motorcycle. I can get lunch. Uh, the bridge folks were very, very nice that worked on the bridge until I got that call of someone over the rail and found out about the suicides. This is So you why didn't I know? I, I had no idea. And I lived in Marin wow. County, which Marin County, for the, for the listeners and viewers, connects to San Francisco via the Golden Gate Bridge. So I had been to San Francisco hundreds, if not thousands of times. My father had a business in San Francisco, so he went every day. Hmm. But I had no idea. The number of folks who were suffering that came to that bridge no idea i had no way i have seen that film uh the bridge so i mean i know about the golden gate and and what happens there but i didn't know about the numbers and i actually looked it up and what i found was that until i mean the last time that the, the, the last number they have is one one thousand seven hundred people have jumped from the bridge Wow. Since it was, yeah, since it was inaugurated in 1937. So that's a right. lot. Yeah. And, and, and from have... what I know of you, you received, how, how long did you work there for? Um, I worked on, on the bridge about 10 years. Yeah. And it was like hundreds of calls, right? So I would average four to six calls a month. Wow. That's either somebody over that pedestrian rail or on the sidewalk or in the parking lots, you know, something would bring our attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, I wanted to share this with you in 2019, there were 28 confirmed suicides and one 167 interventions. So almost 14 a month. Wow. So yeah, it went up a lot. Yes. Tell me, you talked about the first call you received. I mean, how was that for you? I'm sure it was pretty scary, huh? The it first was, one. I didn't have any training in this. I didn't know what to do, what to say. And then there was a part of me that was this police officer that we go in and take charge. So part of me was, well, this individual is over that rail. She's trespassing. So there's, there's that little part of me. But there's the other part that, that when I figure it out, okay, she is suicidal. Now, what do I do? Because I didn't have any training in this. So it was very much a disservice to that woman and myself, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I should have been a lot more prepared to handle something like this. Well, I'm sure that has changed over time because a little right, bit, but <laughs> yeah. a little bit, really not much. It should be more. In my opinion, they have most of the officers now are trained in crisis intervention training, CIT. But that's mm -hmm. ground level there. I think there's a lot more to do. You know, if we could go to a negotiator school or be trained by someone who has done a number of these and they're not. So it's still going in and trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how many people, and I ask this of my audience is how many people have been trained in active listening skills, a specific class in active listening skills. Many times, not even mental health professionals have been. 
They really oh, have. Oh no, no, many programs don't even cover yeah. that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure my listeners don't even know what we're talking about right now, right? So, Active listener, listening. Just check it out. Go on Google and, and check it out. It's really, really helpful. It's, you learn a lot of skills on how to communicate, but mainly how to listen. Right, and what to say, what not to say. There's things like minimal encouragers. You know, a summary, a reflecting. And then, of mm-hmm. course, are we standing? Are we sitting? Are our arms crossed? Mm-hmm. Are we doing Body that? language, yeah. Are we leaning in? There's so many things to this. I find it fascinating. I'm still learning about it. You know, normalization, mm-hmm. validation, gratitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you can tell, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, and I'm trying to become yeah. better at it as I go along. So Yeah, yeah. It, like but it's I mean, communication we learn until we die, right? Absolutely. If you're not learning something, what are you doing? You know, we become complacent. So, yeah. So Kevin, tell me about what you've learned of over the years. I'm sure that uh, the first one was the hardest because you probably didn't know what to say, uh, what to ask, how to listen. And, but I know that you didn't, you didn't lose many people. How many, how many actually was it? two or three two that i was directly involved with speaking to there were others where i was either on the supervisor supervising the incident or on the sides of it so to speak Um, Uh uh-huh this bridge is very very unique Hmm. and i think in talking with someone um, you know it is it's very difficult and it's it'd be nice to have a lot more training for folks who do this type of incident Mm-hmm. What did you see there? Um, what you said? You said, well, most of them are there because they don't know what to do. They're in pain and they want to get rid of the pain. Tell us a little bit of the stories that you heard. Right. You know, and and they've lost hope, mm-hmm. and they feel hopeless to do anything about what's going on with them. So they don't know what to do, but they know they're going to end this pain for the most part. They can't go on with this, and sometimes there's shame involved. Mm-hmm. whether they were abused or maybe they haven't told their family that they're gay you know there's that issue sometimes well there's a lot of different things and of course every single one is a little different and a little unique so I would say that even though I had some training in this eventually maybe I'm not the one and first I have to realize about me Maybe I'm not the one to speak to that individual either. If I cannot develop rapport and get a breakthrough, maybe it's somebody else. So that's something that, that I really have to do. And when I, when I teach negotiators, this is what I say. If your department is big enough and you have multiple people that can speak to someone, if I'm not making a breakthrough and developing rapport, then let's try someone else. We have to make it about them. It is not the Kevin Briggs show. It's not how many people I've saved. And I don't even like that word, to be honest with you. It's how many Mm -hmm. people I've helped, but it has to be about them. And of course, um, I have, we've all had our trial, trial, trials and things that uh, have been tough on us. I've had cancer. I've had multiple surgeries. I've had uh, three stents in my heart, a divorce, a number of things. Mm-hmm. But I don't talk about those when I'm talking to someone over the rail because it needs to be about them. That's where the focus needs to be. Mm-hmm. And not that I can fix everything or anything, but I can certainly be there and listen to them and allow them to vent. Mm-hmm. Were there some stories that stuck to you? There's a few of them. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. One gentleman, and we always try to learn from things. One gentleman was up near the north end of the bridge and I was with a couple other officers who were senior officers who have had time on like I did. And we were talking with this gentleman. He was African-American, not under the influence of alcohol or drugs or anything. He wouldn't tell us his name, but we kind of took turns speaking with him. So we all didn't throw out something at the same time. He was very kind and polite. And as we spoke with him, he wouldn't provide us with a lot of information. We were trying to see what was going on that day, what made this incident as it is of why he's over the rail. And he wouldn't go into details and he wouldn't give us his name. But he was very kind, very polite. And as we spoke with him, he would turn around and he shook my hand. And he shook my hand twice 
And then he reached around again and he said, Kevin, I want to thank you for everything, but I have to go. He shook my hand and he jumped. Oh my God, Kevin. And it was absolutely horrible. And I, and I said, you know what? This is the last time I'm ever going to have more than one person talking to someone over the rail. There's a number of things I thought that we could have done different, but also maybe none of it would have made a difference for this individual. He wanted to do this. He came here to do this, but there's always that little piece of us that says, what could I have done different? So that haunts us. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, when he jumped, I watched him go all the way down, which is another thing I tell people, don't watch that act because that's what's going to stick in your mind for the rest of your life. There are uh, things that, that folks can do, that therapists can do, that you can go through that can help with that. And I've done that also, but it's still always going to be there. You know, but we try to build on that and how can we try to do better even though deep down inside us, we know that they make that call. It's not our fault. Yeah, but that's but that's that that's your your prefrontal cortex talking, right? That's your <laughs> rational, uh, right. the, the rational part of your brain talking. But the emotional part, I mean, it's ingrained in that that image, right? And it's really hard to get that out of your mind. I'm really sorry. Wow. Yeah. Can't even imagine. Let's yeah. talk about someone you saved. I know you don't like the word, so I'll just change. What did you say? Yeah, you helped. Help someone, right? Yeah. Tell me, tell me, tell me a story of someone you helped that stuck to you. That was someone sure. maybe that you special I story. A call. I'm on my motorcycle and I, I received a call of a man on the sidewalk saying that he's gonna jump and he's on a cell phone talking to one of his uh, loved ones who that individual called 911. So I'm very close to the bridge at that time. I start working my way down the sidewalk. And as I neared the North Tower, I see him on the sidewalk, matching the description. So I'm back by the North Tower. I stop. And as I'm getting off of my motorcycle, I'm about 50 feet away or so from him. He looks my direction and he leaps over the, the pedestrian rail. And I yelled something to him. I can't remember what it was, but he reached out, caught the rail, swung around, slammed into it, and he landed on this little bitty pipe that's wow. down below. And that's it. There's nothing else. It's around 220 feet to the water after that. But he caught himself. I thought he was gone. But I saw mm -hmm. through the, the metal deals on the bridge there. And I see his white t-shirt. And I said, wow, he, he caught himself. He's still here. So I ran up there and I was around 15 feet away. And what I typically do is I'll raise my hand and I'll go, hi, I'm Kevin. Is it okay if I come up and speak with you for a while? I don't say I'm with the California Highway Patrol. They can see the uniform and all of this. So I know I'm someone of authority, a public figure, but I just say, hi, I'm Kevin. I give him my first name. Is it okay if I come up and speak with you for a while? And he wanted nothing to do with me. He would yell at me. If you come one step closer, I'm jumping. And he was really sincere about this. There was no games. He, he was mad. He, he just wanted to be left alone. Mm -hmm. But of course, I'm not going to do that. So it was quite some time. I would kept telling him, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to grab you. I just want to come up and talk with you for a while. So after some time, he did allow me. And when he did, when I got up to him, I knelt down, um, and which is really difficult because of course that bridge sidewalk is just cement and it's really hard and, and it's difficult to do, but I don't like looking down at someone because I think that's what we're doing. I want to be equal. So I knelt down and pretty much he's looking down at me, which is fine. Okay. I want that. And of course, we're always keeping officer safety in mind. We have to watch out for that. Mm -hmm. And we started talking. Uh, and I got his first name, which was Kevin. So same as mine. That made it easy oh. with, with my poor memory. So he allowed me to call him his first name by his first name. And that's what I did. And I'm going to personalize everything. And I want yeah. us to meld as much as we can mm -hmm. together. Connection, build, right? Yes, it's all about making a connection. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what I tried to do. And I found out, hey, Kev, what's going on today, man? How come you're over the rail? I mean, you must really be going through some stuff. So he started talking to me and, and he spoke for a long time and he told me the story of how he was adopted and his birth mother wanted nothing to do with him. So he was adopted. His adopted parents loved him very much. But when he was around 13 years old, they divorced and it wasn't explained to him why they were divorced. So he thought he caused this. He broke up this yeah. family unit and that was brutal on him. He suffered from a mental illness. He was supposed to be on some medication, but wasn't. And that's a big one that I see with people up there is they have stopped their medication. Oh, yes. Um, and being suffering from mental illness, what he did to cope with that was stay busy. So all through school, he would play sports. He played six different sports and he would just run himself ragged till he was so exhausted he would just fall asleep. Because it said at night is when the very, very tough time for him would occur when he would be in bed by himself trying to sleep. So if he could just totally exhaust himself, that's how he would fall asleep and be able to get some sleep. Oh, poor thing. So he just exhausted himself every single day that he could. And when he got out of school, he started working and had a job and thought to himself, you know, if I start a family, things will get better. So he started a family and had a baby. But his baby was born a couple of months premature and had to stay in the hospital. Now, Kev thinks, what did I do to cause harm to this baby? I've blown it once again. Baby had to stay in the hospital a couple of months. And when she was able to come home, so did a bill for around $250,000. Oh, my God. And on top of all this, he lost his job. So now he thinks he caused harm to his family. He cannot take care of and support his family. He thinks he's just blowing it left and right. He has had enough. So he lived in Oakland. He found his way over to the Golden Gate Bridge where he's never been before. And this is where we meet. So this took a long time, over an hour for him to tell me all of this. Mm -hmm. This story as we're going back and forth. And I'm just listening and giving him my full attention. I'm not trying to grab him. And my reason for that, and I think it's so important is, yes, I could reach right through the bridge rails and grab him and hold him and then get somebody else over there and we can pull him over. But it takes so much courage to go over that pedestrian rail. Can you imagine that the courage that it takes to come back over that rail where I'm at and start life again? with all those issues, whatever it may be for oh, any yeah. that rail. That's a good point. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to get at. I want him to come back on his own. And that way I think his chances of survival will be much better. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think in my mind, what could I tell this young man? What could I come up with that would make him want to live? And I'm thinking of this the whole time he's telling me his story which I'm very thankful he told me the story first. For me, it's given me ammo, so to speak. Time, right? Yeah, it right. Gives, gives you time to know what is the next step, right? right? Right, the more time that we have together, the better. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to talk about his child. Hey, Kev, tell me more about your kid. Yep. What's he like, you know, and everything about her. And so he's telling me all these different things. And she had a birthday coming up. And I said, well, Kev, don't you think you want to be there for her birthday? I said, you can come back here anytime you yeah. want. What do you think her life's going to be without you? And do you know that if you lose your life here today from suicide, she has a much greater chance of suicide. So I didn't want to tell him, how could you do this to your daughter? I didn't want no. to do that. Or shame him, right? I yes. mean, he had already, he, he already had enough That's shame. But I also wanted to be brutally honest with him. So mm -hmm. I told him this. And then I do this frequently with people because there's so much going on. And I think maybe they're not hearing everything I say. They hear it, but maybe it takes some time to process. Mm -hmm. So I said, Kev, I'm going to take a step back and give you some time to think. But I'm only going to do that if you promise me not to do anything until I come back up here. I want to give them time to really think about everything that's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay. So I stepped back about 15 feet and I'm watching him 
and he's pretty much looking at me and, and down uh, at the ground and, and not down at the water, which is a good sign. Yeah. So I gave him a few minutes. And then uh, again, I asked his permission and with my raised hand, open palm. Kev, is it okay if I come back up? Okay, sure. I go back up and I says, so Kev, what do you think? Everything we've been talking about and everything you've been going through, you know, tell me what's going through your mind about today and today's event and what we've been talking about. And he just sat there for a minute or so. And he goes, Kevin, I, I want to come back over today. So that's when I helped mm -hmm. him come back over. It was really cool. The look in someone's wow. eyes when you come back. It's the hope, but they're scared. <sighs> and I also tell them things too, because people think, if they're in that situation, well, if I come back, now I'm going to be arrested. Now I'm in trouble. Now I've been trespassing. I took up police officer's time. But I tell them that. I go, you're not in any trouble. Because most of the time, these folks don't have warrants. They haven't done anything wrong. They're just mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. And I always tell them when you come back. I don't say if, but when you come back over, here's what's going to happen. I have to place you in handcuffs. That's only because that's our policy. And then I'm going to take you down to one of the local hospitals for an evaluation. And that's it. You're not going to get a ticket in the mail. You're not going to be a report. Nothing goes to the DA. Not in that's trouble. Wow. Right. They're not in trouble. So that really helps in their mind, you know, because yeah. then they think if they are in trouble, well, on top of everything else, now I'm in trouble. No, that's not what's going to happen. Yeah. So he decided, that's a great story. <laughs> and when he did, when he came back over and I congratulated him, I asked him, Kev, because I want to learn each and every time, what did I do that was good? And what did I do that you didn't like so much? And he thought about that for a second. And he said, you let me speak. You listened and you let me speak. Mm. So I tell folks, why so did it basic. take someone to get to this, I say, stage four cancer of a bridge at times for somebody to listen? There's no magic. I could go to 100 different negotiator schools. But unless I'm willing to listen and not judge and, and tell these folks, you know what you should have done. Until I can sit there and listen and take this in and have empathy, you know, that's what this guy and that's what most folks are looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But as you said, we're not trained for that. And I was listening to you telling this story and I'm just thinking, well, so many, you did so many things, actually, as you said, you, you started from a pl place of compassion and empathy you didn't judge you didn't point fingers and this is a man who was plagued by shame and guilt so you didn't tell him what you're doing is wrong you didn't yeah you didn't shame him and you did something very important too you talked to him about reasons to live right and that's that's i think that was the shift when you said tell me about your daughter right Let's right. get you out of this place of, I have debts, I have problems, I have, you know, $250,000, my, my daughter wasn't okay, it was my fault, and, and it kept going back to, you know, I was adopted, that was my fault too, and that was the place where he was, and the only, one of the only ways that you can actually get someone out of that state is to shift for something that they can hold on to and say it's worth it living for this right so you did that too and i'm sure that took years and years uh, for you to to learn what works right and and even the, the the body language that you said you know when you sit down and you look them in the eye that's very important too that's active listening one of the skills, right, in active listening, you look them in the eye. The other thing you didn't do that was very helpful, you didn't touch him because that can be threatening, especially for someone who experiences trauma and you don't know who they are, you just met them, right? So Absolutely. don't touch someone who is in that state because that, that can throw them over the edge, right? So I don't know, we could talk about all these techniques here for hours. It just, yeah, right. just show it just show that you really learned over the yeah. years, right? I think that and not trying to fix it, especially as guys, because we always try to fix things to say, well, you know what you should have done? You know, these things, no, there was nothing that I could fix for him right then, but I could offer him maybe a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's look at your daughter here and and how is she going to be? And don't you want to be there? Yeah, you have a lot of issues. We all do. But 
you know, maybe we need a different coping mechanism. Maybe work one on one on these different issues. I'm here today for you. Somebody else may be here for you tomorrow. At least you'll have the opportunity to have a go at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that uh, you said, I always wanted to learn. Did you often ask them what helped and what, what were the answers that you remember? I mean, listening, I'm sure it's a main one. It what really is like giving them the full attention. And mind you, I have a cell phone that may be going off. I have a radio that may be going off. And I'll be honest with you, and I've told people this, and it's a big no-no, but I turn my radio off. I don't want this to happen. What am I going to do with this? I don't care what the calls are. I don't care what the... This is my focus right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's other officers that are stopping the pedestrians. If something really happens, they'll yell to me. But my focus when I'm doing these is on that individual. And I want it to be such a click um, that... If they're not wearing a jacket and anybody that's been on the Golden Gate Bridge knows how bitter cold it gets most of the time, mm -hmm. I'm not going to wear a jacket. Kev was not wearing a jacket. He actually just had on a white t-shirt mm -hmm. and he was freezing cold. There was wow. a, a helicopter out in the bay that took a picture that folks can see this picture of him over the rail and me talking with him. And he's wearing a white t-shirt and just some shorts. He has his left hand in his pocket. His right hand is actually up between his t-shirt and and his skin because he's so cold and he's just leaning in so he's tripoding he has his feet on this mm -hmm. little pipe and his head against the rail of the bridge there a big gust of wind which anybody been on that bridge they will tell you it's so windy yeah um, but with that kind of emotional pain i'm sure he didn't feel it he didn't care he was ready to go mm -hmm. yeah yeah did it change the way you saw suicide, Kevin? Did you have any misconceptions before you started doing this work? Any taboo, any biases? You know, um, in talking with folks, I, I, I didn't know much about mental illness, even though I suffered from it. Way mm. back deep, deep, deep in my mind, I would think it's a weakness, even though I'm seeing people with it. Really? And I suffer from it. I'm thinking... Here I was, I was in the military, I jumped out of planes, I worked at San Quentin State Prison, I'm a, you know, with the California Highway Patrol on a motor, these macho jobs where we don't show a weakness, you don't, you don't talk about things, you do them, you go home, maybe a drink, you come back the next day and you do it all again. So we didn't talk about things. But after seeing what I saw and experiencing being diagnosed with depression, I have a complete different view of it. I really do. And I think that helps me with my compassion. Uh, I see many people don't understand why someone might want to take their life. They've never had anybody in their family. They don't understand it. Maybe they think it's a joke. Well, you know, they're a knucklehead and, and, and all that. Until you are around it and you see what that is, it's like, what? It is yeah. so brutal and it destroys yeah. families. It is okay. so sad. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and also you're saying, well, most people don't know what suicide is. And, and when you don't know what you do, you judge, right? So there are all these uh, uh, judgments about suicide or oh, because it's for cowards and it's for people who don't care. They don't care about their families. They're self selfish. And here you are telling us the story of this man who thinks that he's a burden to his family and he wants to free them, right? And that's what happens so many times with suicide. They feel that they actually believe that their families, their friends, they'll be better off if he's gone. And I I'm see sure that you saw a lot you of that. Right. I see that. And there's three things that I saw 99% of the time up there. They felt like they were a burden to their families. Mm -hmm. They suffered from a mental illness, whether diagnosed or not. And if they were taking a medication for a mental illness, they stopped, they stopped it a month or so prior. Those three things I saw almost every single time. Wow, Kevin. You know, every client that I have that is taking medication, I often beg them. I paint like the darkest picture I can. I said, no matter what happens, I know you're going to feel, oh, I don't need this anymore because I'm feeling so well. And I think it's done. I'm, you know, I'm off my crisis. Do not stop. Please, and you listener, if you're watching this or if you're listening, you take medication. Yes, you might be feeling better, but guess what? It's because of the medication. And if you stop it, I don't know. I, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this, Kevin. If you stop medication for mental illness, you go into a dark hole. And it's you, much harder to get out of it. Right. And the medications, of course, they come 
with some sometimes nasty side effects. And I've had folks up there to tell me, I can't take this anymore. The doctors aren't understanding me. They're not listening to me. The medications don't work. I haven't, well, I'm telling you, try something else. They're coming out with medications, new ones all the time. Mm -hmm. Give it a chance to get it right. It may take a long time. It did. I've it does, tried a couple yeah. of different meds. You did? Oh yeah. Still working on things. Um, and I tell folks, I have days where I do not feel like going out of this house. The anxiety and things, I don't want to, I can't take a step out the house. But the thing is, I know it will pass. And that's a big one with folks is they think they're going to be stuck in this huge hole for the rest of their lives and they can't take it anymore. They're tired of the pain. But I, mm -hmm. for me, I know it'll pass. It'll take time. And sometimes I have to force myself to step out of this house and get out for a little walk. And then I feel better. Mm hmm little steps right little by little that's what it is yeah right. because sometimes when we are in that place we go but how how am i going to get from not wanting to get out of bed to being happy you won't guess what it won't but you may get out of bed and feel a little bit better just so you can eat for example and that's going to make you feel better too and right. just step you know little steps and one day at a time you just don't jump from being uh, depressed to happiness it doesn't help it doesn't happen that way right it, i don't well and i'm not a therapist a mental health professional therapist but mm. for me i tell you it doesn't happen it's like when you get a cold you know and, and you're feeling right you just don't go in bed not feeling right to bam i'm great and everything around no it's little by little by little mm -hmm. by little i had cancer when i was 20 years old testicular cancer if wow. i didn't take care of that i went through three surgeries and months of chemotherapy you know mm. i didn't go from Let's see, about 175 pounds back then when I was 20 years old, down to 130, right back to being healthy and good again. It took a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. some folks think that it's not going to get better. But we, you know, it, it may take a long time. Maybe you're one of the few, the lucky ones that things click and it does go quick and you are feeling better rather mm -hmm. quick. Mm -hmm. Some of us, it takes a long time, some people years. Yeah. Kevin, tell me, tell me about your experience with the, you said that you were diagnosed with depression. When was there a day when you just said, you know what, there is something, something wrong here. I need to see a doctor. I mean, how did that happen for you? Because as you said, you didn't even talk about it. Didn't right. even know anything about mental illness. What I found was I could go to work and I'm great. Everything's fine. Um, but when I came home, I had times to where I didn't want to go out of the house. I could sit on a couch for days. I had good days too, where I do things, but there was a, many times where I didn't want to take the dogs for a walk. I have two boys I and divorced. I didn't want to go down and, and see my boys. I didn't want to be bothered. I didn't even want to answer the phone. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking, how could I go to work and be great? Everything's fine and come home and just a lot of times be this nothing. Just leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see anybody. I just want to sit here. How is that? So hmm. finally, uh, through a routine physical, going to my doctor who knows my history of, of all of the things that I've, that I've had with head injuries and everything else, mm -hmm. he had me take a test, uh, the patient health questionnaire, PHQ-9, just nine questions. How are you feeling? You know, you just have the joy in life. Um, yeah. and, and these questions, which I would ask anybody to take, PHQ-9. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do so well on it. I'm pretty much, I flunked it. So he's mm -hmm. holding this piece of paper when he comes in the room with me and he goes, Kevin, you have depression. How do you feel about this? And wow, wow that must have been a shock for you. I was, because on top of all these other things, like I said, I've had heart surgeries and cancer and I've been down on my motorcycle. I got hit head on by another motorcyclist who crossed double yellows. So I was out for quite some time, all of these things, and now depression. I'm like, Phew. Wow. So that's how that started. And that really hit me. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. what else? What else could I go through? I think I'm taking yeah. 30 different people and I'm getting everything that happens to them. Oh my goodness. That must have been hard for you. And what, what do you think now looking back and, and of course your current life, what has helped you? I was on a medication that he put me on, and then I went to see a psychiatrist, and she put me on a different medication. And then I went through eye movement 
desensitization and reprocessing. I went through some therapy for some trauma that I had, and that helped. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things that, that I would have never done years ago. That wow, I thought good I for you. Rock, you know, I'm not going to die. Um, with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, I had to do some rethinking, reprocessing of things. I started doing meditation, transcendental meditation, and that really helped. And really? years ago, I would have never done anything like that. If anybody <laughs> talked about it, I'd leave the room. So <laughs> we have to start thinking about ourselves. I think many people give, 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 give to others, and it's always about them. But if we don't put ourselves at that level also, you know, we run the risk of falling apart. So I really had to adjust my way of thinking and take time for me, mm -hmm. take time for spending with my boys. And, and I have two small dogs, two chihuahuas, just by playing with your animals and petting your animals, that takes a lot of stress away. Oh and, yeah. Animals and, uh, are the best. <laughs> it is. It really is. Many, many times when I land off of that plane from a speaking event, I want to see my dogs before I want to see anybody else. So, <laughs> so talk about, about talk about unconditional love. That's where is. you see it, right? There's Unless no you don't give them food, of course. Of then course. it's very conditional. But if you give them food, that's unconditional They're love. <laughs> they just want to be by you. So there's no complaining. Yeah. There's no asking me for money. There's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> So you yeah. have to figure out what works for you. Maybe it's mm -hmm. yoga, you know, and I do um, pretty much, I call it talk therapy, but we're talking about everything. I have some friends that have way different jobs than I had. One, mm -hmm. one worked at Chevron. One was a dentist, a young, or another lady who's, who's quite older than me. She was involved in World War II in Europe. Um, so these vast, you know, quite different. Yeah. But we get together four times a week or so cool. we're just talking about excellent everything. Yeah. excellent that's yeah and it doesn't have to be therapy right it doesn't have to be you, do, you don't have to be a mental health to see a mental health professional you, you just you, you just have to be willing really to yeah. try something because as you said you try emdr you tried medication you did therapy you did transcendental uh, med meditation friends whatever works and it, it may not work the first time but keep trying right because here you That's are true. you have saved hundreds of lives and you still do because you're doing your trainings you're teaching other people on how to do it is there anything else that you want to add in terms of what to do because here my listeners many of them i mean they're not at the golden gate bridge but they might have a family member who is contemplating right. suicide or who has attempted many times and uh, what I want is for always to give them tools. So you gave you gave us very precious uh, tips on on how to approach them. Is there anything else, or maybe something to avoid? Anything else you would like to add for oh, those, you know, parents and and people yeah. who have someone attempting? Or I would say, don't be afraid to have that courageous conversation with someone. If you see signs that maybe someone is isolating themselves now in their room. Uh, they don't want to come out. They're giving away possessions. Maybe they stop bathing. They're talking or writing about suicide or death. Maybe they're not suicidal, but let's find out. Don't be afraid to have that conversation and say, hey, you know what? I've been noticing these things. I heard this. Tell them straight out. Tell them you care for them and you're there for them. Let them speak. Don't try to fix things right then. Now we're just having a conversation. And I have some things not to say that I tell folks. Okay. And I say, you should calm down. I understand things will get better. So we try to mm -hmm. avoid those. Okay. If I tell you, and you're coming out and kind of you're in crisis, you know, you're contemplating taking your life. And I tell you what you should have done. You're going to shut down because you don't want to hear that then. It's not the time mm -hmm. for that. But if I say something like, well, have you tried this? You have a much better way of saying that. Mm-hmm. And if mm -hmm. I tell you to calm down in the midst of this. Oh, anybody, even I got angry right now. <laughs> yeah, calm down. You know, have you, has anybody ever calmed down when you tell them to calm down? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> it's the most irritating thing you can ever say, right? And if they're telling me everything's going on and I tell them, and I've given you some of my history and I tell them, I totally understand what you're going through. Been there a hundred times. Now I'm just putting a foot on you and setting you down. That's not right. You know, but if I use that, 
maybe as part of a summary and trying to figure out what's going on so I can understand it better. So if I understand you correctly, this is what's been going on. You know, you should calm down. I understand. And telling someone things will get better. Mental health professionals may be able to do that, but I certainly can't. But everything's going to be fine. A few weeks, a few months later even, and things aren't, you know, they're not going to have that trust in me. So I try mm -hmm. to stay clear of those. But validating them, if it's real and if it's true. Yeah, yeah. it's something like, wow, that must have been hard for you. Absolutely. You're going right. through a lot of rough times right now. Anybody who's been going through all that may be thinking about killing themselves. If it comes to that, normalize their situation. Validate and normalize are huge, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Wow. You're, do you want to work with me? <laughs> <laughs> You're totally a mental health professional. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should start training together. That would be cool. <laughs> But see, I average four to six a month. You're probably doing that a day. That's a lot of baggage. That's a lot of work. Well, I've been working with this for quite a while now, and I have to say it's it's very well, you know, you, you do your work is similar. It's very rewarding. You know, when you get an email, sometimes I do that. I get emails and messages from people. It's it's very rewarding. It's it's tough and it's very hard. And that's why it's self-care is so important. And uh, you you seem to have learned what works for you, and, and that's the most important thing because What works for me doesn't work for everybody, right? Right, right. So, Kevin, stick around. Keep talking to your friends. Do your meditation because we want to see you around, okay? And hopefully soon, maybe we'll meet in person when this bloody COVID is gone. Yeah. We, we now have the vaccine. We have a light, right, out there. At least yeah. we see. We have some hope. Thank you so much for talking to us, Kevin. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you.